The trial was a media circus with various theories and two defendants ripe for ridicule. But what drove two well-to-do brothers to plot and murder their parents? Was it greed, abuse, or just an urge to kill? This week's episode is The Menendez Brothers, Part 1. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? I would like to rant about something, if I may. Always. Anytime. It's my favorite thing. It has zero to do with what we're talking about today. Even better. I had one of the worst fast food experiences of my life this afternoon. Have we ascended to the point that we utilize our platform to (laughs) seek revenge on those who've wronged us? So, Burger King, (laughs) this one's for you. Okay. I had left the doctor then had to go get my prescription filled i hello everyone i have a kidney infection as i sit here i'm in a lot of pain she's a trooper she's here so i get my prescription filled and i two days ago had been in the suburbs and had had a very pleasant burger king experience with their grilled chicken salad i wanted to recreate that so i go to a burger king by my house that was my first mistake I get in the drive-thru line. I have to place my order three different times at the speaker. What is hard about I'd like a grilled chicken salad and a medium unsweet tea? Was it three different people? It was two different people. (laughs) That's probably one of the problems. So I pull up. A girl says, welcome to Burger King. How can I help you? Blah, blah, blah. I said, just one second because I was waiting to see if Tommy wanted anything. I was waiting for him to text me back. That's a good wife. Thank you. So then I'm like, okay, I'm ready to order. And a dude is now talking and he's like, oh, he's clearly high out of his mind. And so if I placed to, my order. If you had to work at Burger King, you might get high too. It might help Maybe, you pass the day. But I'm still functional when I'm high. Well. So I order. You're a professional. I order. And then he just goes, my bad. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'd like a grilled chicken salad and a medium unsweet tea. To his credit, he asked you to repeat it. He could have just mashed in whatever. That's true. And then he goes, cool, 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 cool. (laughs) Is that it? And I said, yes. And he said, pull around. I'll have your total at the window. So I pull around. Now it's a girl again. And she, I have to wait for several minutes. And she opens the window and says, what'd you order? I love this so much. And I said, a grilled chicken salad. Oh, I also ordered an extra grilled chicken patty. I always get double grilled chicken on you my went salads. Double meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like a lot of meat. Yeah, she does. And so I told her again. She goes, okay. And so she starts plugging in. She goes, so grilled chicken sandwich? I said, no. A grilled chicken salad and a medium unsweet tea with an extra grilled chicken patty. Sweet tea? God damn it. <laughs> no. Some days, do you think the when, universe is testing you I to see? I was like, how is there? I'm ordering three things. And... It's like the simplest order. So finally, she, I thought, had it. So I sit there for about five minutes. She comes back. She hands me the bag. It's a potato. <laughs> it's just an uncooked potato with a it's sad a, face It's on a it. Whopper Junior. So she, Is it really a Whopper No, no, no. <laughs> but it's, so usually when you order an extra grilled chicken patty, they chop it up and put it on the salad. Oh, no, no. This is in a this, tin foil. It was just a chicken patty in a, in a styrofoam thing. The salad is not grilled chicken. It is breaded chicken. Oh, no. I can't eat that. So I said, (sighs) she'd already closed the window. So I just sat, sit there looking at her and she comes back. Not a word. I said, this is breaded chicken, not grilled. She goes, oh. So she takes it back from me. She walks away. She comes back and hands it to me. It's the same salad with just a grilled chicken patty plopped on top. Does she let you keep the breaded one? Yes, but I didn't want it. Well, you know what? You got a bonus patty. <laughs> but but who just, who in their right mind would think, oh, this is how I solve this problem. Go get me a brand new fucking salad. Don't just put what I ordered on top of this shit I didn't order. So I, then I was like, I just looked at her. I go, I didn't want any of the breaded chicken. And she just stares at me. 
And I go, you guys need to get it together. And I drove off. <laughs> Did you really? At least you felt better about saying that. My my thing is like, I wish I could float through life and just not give a shit. Oh, well, as same. Much as of but I'm 40 a, and I am well aware I'm not that person. Well, as you say, yeah, as much as of a non nonchalant, not give a shit attitude I have, like the thought of someone being mad at me, even if somebody I was just selling a salad to, just crushes me. Yeah. Like, I have to be liked and uh, uh, appreciated. She did not care if I liked God, her. God, I wish I, I could <laughs> be like her. God. <laughs> That's you, that. But here's my thing, too. Back to you saying, well, wouldn't you be high if you worked at Burger King? Maybe. Probably, but there's a lot of jobs I'd probably be high at, including like being the CEO of Google or something. Like yeah. it doesn't really matter. That's part of the employee benefits package at Google. <laughs> yeah. That's why they drive you got on that bus. An entire vape room that's just uh, <laughs> the best weed you can have. But my point is, no matter what job you're doing, do it well and and take pride in it. Even if you're doing something that you don't give a shit about. Act like you give a shit about it because other people want you to give a shit about it and depend on you giving a shit about it. I'm telling you, what if, I mean, what a world we would live in if everyone just, just was fly by their pants like, who gives a shit? Stick the other chicken on there. Fuck them. What a great, I mean, not not a great society. It would probably be, no one would stop at no, stop it'd signs. No, it'd be anarchy. It would be complete anarchy. Yeah. We need, we have rules for a reason and we all need to operate within those guidelines. I'm so sorry this happened to you. But I will say. <sighs> I'm okay the, now. You got a kidney infection, so the same, or the breaded chicken situation, not the worst thing that happened to you all day. Well, I'm trying to do keto. Oh, Okay. That's why I wanted the grilled. I'm just allergic to bread and chicken. I know, but we're both we're both on keto now. You guys, we're both I, trying I, to do some keto. I didn't really want to talk about it because I feel like everybody that doesn't talks about it. So I was trying to be incognito keto. No, well, that's CrossFit. We, we don't do CrossFit, so we don't talk about no, that. But I've never done keto. I've done Atkins, and I tried to ask Tommy to explain the difference, and he said, I've never done Atkins, so I don't know. I think the Atkins guy died of a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, I think you eat a lot more meat and protein on Atkins than you do on keto, and keto is more fat. Well, I will say we're privileged people that we can have such a lofty diet that involves avocado and coconut oil and that we are able to go to Burger King and, and you know, get mad about it. You know who else was privileged? <laughs> Nice segue. Uh, the Menendez brothers. Now, I'll say you and I are a comfortable middle class ish existence. Yeah. These people were net getting picked up in a limousine. They were in the one percent. Yes. They lived a life that few live growing up. Oh a life gosh. of luxury, want for nothing, but also a terrible home life. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. It's two sides of the coin. There are. So, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And this week, we are discussing the Menendez brothers. We're and gonna... the chicken salad catastrophe. <laughs> chicken, yeah. that We will do a whole episode on that. It'll probably be a month-long four-parter. I'm going to apply to work at that Burger King. you got to go infiltrate it from the inside. <laughs> also, free french fries. So, win-win. There you go. Well, we're going to break this into two parts. This one is going to be about their up. Bringing, how they grew up, the parents, everything basically leading up to them being arrested. So it will include the murder. But then the next episode will be all about the various trials. There were My multiple. My God, there were multiple trials. Lots it of was footage. a circus. Yeah. And this was going on at the same time OJ was going on. Yeah, the 90s we, were a crazy time. Uh, the 90s at the L.A. County District Attorney's Office yes. were a crazy time. Because yes. it's the same that Gil Garcetti was a DA mm -hmm. at, this, I mean, at this time and was overseeing the various assistant DAs that were on each of these cases. Can you imagine? No. I mean, he, that's nuts. That's, I don't think he anticipated ever having this kind of uh, resume when he signed up for that job. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into it. In 1944... Jose Enriquez Menendez was born in Havana, Cuba, to a prosperous family. His father was a well-known soccer player who also owned his own accounting firm, and his mother was a successful swimmer who had been inducted into the Cuba Sports Hall of Fame. While the family was not among the super elite, they did very well for themselves, and Jose and his sisters wanted for nothing. In 1959, at the age of 16, Jose and his family's lives were suddenly uprooted when Fidel Castro overthrew the Cuban government and seized their property, forcing them to flee to the United States. I think even if you're not super wealthy here, I mean, you're a famous. It's both. Both of his parents are professional athletes. Yes, they They're were well celebrities in Cuba and business owners. And man, can you imagine everything you have? It's just gone. It's just gone. They just come in and say this house. It's very nice. It's, it's, a, tra it's a tragedy. Very yeah. sad. Yes. 
Well, Jose had been an excellent student in high school, even winning an athletic scholarship. But finances prevented him from being able to fulfill his dream of attending an Ivy League school, and he ended up at Southern Illinois University, where he met his wife, Mary Louise Kitty Anderson, a communications major. That's a pretty cool nickname. Kitty? Yeah. Where does that come from? Because you think that would come from Catherine. Maybe Louise? Maybe they just, she liked cats. Maybe she was uh, had cat-like tendencies. <laughs> maybe so. She licked her hand and rubbed her hair oh, down. Oh, maybe. She was real quiet and only s- slept all day and got up at night. Yeah. Slept in a windowsill under the sun. <laughs> That's what she I would name my kid. in a little kid. bed under the windowsill. <laughs> <laughs> I'd name my kid Kitty. <laughs> Originally from Oaklawn, Illinois, Kitty was described by many as a vivacious beauty as well as a bit of a rebel, seen out on the town wearing skin-tight dresses and a white wig. She had dreams of becoming an actress when she met the seductive and charming Jose. When she met Jose, it was as if she was, quote, hit by a bulldozer, according to her roommate at the time, Joe McCord, in an interview with the L.A. Times. Yeah, this was like a whirlwind romance, pretty sudden. It was. She had her sights set on Hollywood, and then she met this... And she gave it all up for a dude. The, uh, the dickle do you do? Mm-hmm. While Jose and Kitty came from completely different worlds, the attraction was undeniable. And despite his family saying they were too young to get married, the couple tied the knot in 1963 and soon moved to New York City. Once in New York, Jose finished school at Queens College while working as a dishwasher at the 21 Club to pay for his tuition. Kitty worked as a teacher... And after Jose graduated, he went to work as an accountant at Cooper's and Librand, a prestigious accounting firm. However, his business smarts and attitude attracted the attention of one of the firm's clients, and Jose was hired away to be that company's comptroller. Cooper's and Librand, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is or actually was before it became Price Waterhouse Cooper, which is PwC now. Mm-hmm. Cooper's and Librand for so many years was the accounting firm that did the awards, the Academy Awards. Yes, yes. The guy comes out with the suitcase mm-hmm. and they would be like, oh, I'm from the accounting firm of Cooper's and Librand. Yep. And I was like, man, what a cool job as yeah. a kid. And now I'm like, that would not be a fun job for me. Just mathing all day. No, God, not. that's my nightmare of a job. But now he's a comptroller. Mm-hmm. With the ferocious drive and talent, Jose was determined to be an American success story. And he soon leveraged his position as comptroller to become an executive at Hertz Rental Cars, eventually moving his way up to being in charge of U.S. operations. Let me just say, the first of a couple of O.J. Simpson crossovers. Oh, the, yes. <laughs> because at the time, O.J. Simpson was doing commercials for was them. their spokesperson. Yeah, that's true. Hertz was a subsidiary of RCA, or Radio Corporation of America. And once Jose proved his business skills at Hertz, he was moved to the record division of RCA Areola. Yep, it's called Areola. Googled it it multiple times. It it is, and hmm, yeah, it is. It's shaped like a record, and there's a little thing comes pointing out the (laughs) middle. It's called Areola. It stands to reason. Spelled different than the booby Areola. Yeah. But arguably the same meaning. If it sounds the same, it is the same. That's how words work. That is an odd segue into that line of work though oh completely this was a situation of corporate america going hey buddy you're good at running this car rental thing that's just business why don't you go run this music se- like yeah subsidiary? it's all business 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 and you have a business degree you can do any business and the musicians were like mm, fuck this guy <laughs> but also he was jose was very influ or charming and charismatic yeah. and charismatic and manipulative and also kind of could talk his way into anything pretty much and they said that people would just be really scared so maybe mm-hmm. they said we're not going to promote you and he's like you're going to make me yeah and they're just like okay yeah you're right musicians were skeptical of working with him considering he had no background in the music business but once he signed mega act menudo and helped discover jose feliciano he had once again forced those around him to give him the respect he believed he deserved. Those are big names those to are, sign. Yeah. Huge. So at first when he got signed on, everyone was like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, especially considering the Eurythmics, whose sweet dreams are made oh, of yeah, these great analytics. Song. Yeah. The Eurythmics have released a new record, and they were in a meeting with them talking about how they were going to advertise it. And he goes, we're going to advertise it just like Ghostbusters. <laughs> Wait, what does that mean? Thank you. And that's what Annie Lennox said. She's like, I'm sorry, what? And he said, we're going to put it on Pepsi machines. It's going to be on commercials. And they had to be like, no, that's not how records work. Oh, wow. I was thinking they were going to shoot a 
uh, video, like Slimer style, where <laughs> Annie Lennox is dressed up like uh, Bill Murray. I would watch that. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. then I was thinking, my God, how did that not get greenlit? Because yeah, I would he, love to watch that. He just was, like you said, business is business. He's like, well, Ghostbusters is big, and this is a big record. We'll just do the same thing. And luckily, the artist said, no, thank you. Have you worked? I have worked for bosses like that. Have you worked for bosses like Who that? Who just are uh, believing themselves too much? Yeah. And there's. If they think it, then it can be done. And even as much as you're like, this is not feasible. We can't get a million dollars overnight to make this project happen. Like, it's like, well, I thought of it. So, yeah, it's, what you're, make it happen. You're describing is the my reaction to that is what I call the Heather McKinney method where I just go, let it happen. And you just go, mm-hmm, yeah, we'll do that idea. And then it just explodes. And you're yeah. like, how'd your idea go? Was yeah. it bad? <laughs> Instead, you can't because you can't talk a person no, like no, that out of no. it. If he tells Annie Lennox, I mean, unless you're Annie Lennox, then you can say, I'm not going to market my album like Ghostbusters, right. you jackass. But at the time, you know, if you, you didn't have that kind of capital, you would just have to go, yeah, okay, let's do a Ghostbusters yeah, movie. Okay. We'll see. But then when it does blow up, it's always everyone it's else's fault. fault. Yeah. So then you have to deal with that That's fallout. Fine. Some people believe in themselves too That's much. That's why I can't work for people anymore. <laughs> you're like, I'm done. Because <laughs> I just have zero patience. <laughs> Well, being a hard worker wasn't the only thing for which Jose was known. He had a reputation for being cruel, controlling, and impossible to please. While employers credited him with being highly intelligent and diligent, his co-workers hated him. He was rude, arrogant, and condescending to his subordinates. Jose was described as someone you should be afraid of, someone who demanded perfection. His co-workers feared him. Just as his family did. You know, they say some people have personalities at home. Like, oh, he was a tiger in the boardroom, but at home he was a teddy bear. He was a tiger 24-7 yeah. to everybody in his life. He had this concept of like, I have to regain my family's name. I have to regain the respect we have. And I will stop at nothing yes. to get it. Yes. He ha- he grew up successful in a fairly wealthy family. He wanted that lifestyle to continue, but also to make a name for himself now that he he wanted to be that American success story. And Mm -hmm. he was going to do whatever it took to make that happen. Let nothing stand in his way. Exactly. Well, a few years later, Jose and Kitty decided to start a family. And on January 10th, 1968, their first son was born, Joseph Lyle Menendez. Shortly after, they moved to New Jersey, where on November 27th, 1970, their second son was born. Eric Galen Menendez. I do not respect murderers. Spoiler alert: these people kill their parents. It was in the it was in the written intro. But if you, to, Eric is cuter than Lyle. They're they're not. Oh, it's night and day. There yeah. is something. It's wrong. like Chloe and Kim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, although Chloe's gotten much hotter now, but back in the day, like if you were. Kim Kardashian's sister. It's I mean, no matter what you're, you look you're like. Just but, hey, well, I don't look like that. Welcome to the legal profession, Kim Kardashian. She's going to law school. Uh, no, she's not going to law school. Wait, what? You didn't hear this news? No. Kim Kar- I was in the woods all weekend. Oh, that's true. You were, did not have Wi-Fi. <laughs> Christy what was, happened? Christy was in the woods when we got written about in Vulture. She had no idea. <laughs> no. I was texting her and I was like, well, she quit the show because she won't respond to my messages. And she's like, I'm in the forest. What are you saying? Uh, but no, yeah, Kim Kardashian in California, there is a way that you it's called studying the law. And instead of going to law school, if you have at least 60 college credits, you can do an apprenticeship program under a law firm and they require you to take a miniature bar exam, uh, I think a year in and then. We, uh, monthly you have check-in exams and the law firm that sponsors you, you have like mentor sponsors they check in and come make sure you're doing well and then at the end you take the bar exam just like everybody else and you're a licensed lawyer just like everybody else without going to law school wow uh the pass rate for that method is like six percent really however i mean there's sick that's you're saying there's a chance <laughs> Why is the pass rate so low? Because they didn't go to law school and oh, you need to do that to be a lawyer. Of, you mean because of passing the bar, that pass rate's that low? The the par, bar passage rate for people who do studying the law versus going to law right. school is 6%. Sure, okay. So 94% of people who don't go to law yeah. school I mean, and take the bar sense. exam anyway don't pass. Also, I don't think I want a lawyer representing me that did not go to law school. But the craziest part of that is Kim Kardashian has 60 hours of school? That's what she said, yeah. Or she has 75 credits. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh. While from, she was a, I think while she was a closet organizer, where? she was going to school. Wow. Well, so what is she wanting to do? She wants to be a prim- criminal defense attorney. Oh, Christ. <laughs> okay. 
I hope she is because, my God, that will make for some great episodes. I say the doors to the legal profession are open for those who are worthy to pass through them and go for it. Try yes, it. for those that are worthy to pass through them. If you are deemed worthy, you will pass through. Not that everybody that even passes the bar is deemed worthy. But nevertheless, if you can pass the bar, your character and fitness, and you don't, I don't know, ruin people's lives and get disbarred, by all means. I think she got a taste for all of that when she had that woman pardoned by Trump that had been. Oh, yeah. Uh, sentenced to That's life. That's really for what got her, her husband. husband. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which th- she did a great thing with that. So. And who knows? Maybe this is. Maybe her she. Maybe she says right now she's like I, I'm studying constantly. You guys have no idea. I'm not a Kim Kardashian apologist yet again. I'll. I'll I think re- we've. <laughs> <laughs> determine that you are for the past episodes. <laughs> you know what? If she, uh, more power to her. Kim, I hope you do great. I, like I said, we need good, smart female lawyers. So. That's true. We do. Come on, girl. Well, from the beginning, Lyle and Eric had an unbreakable bond. While the brothers were nearly inseparable, friends that knew both of them said their personalities were quite different. Lyle was the outgoing one with a strong personality and wit. Eric was more sensitive quiet, reserved, and preferred to be by himself. Both Lyle and Eric attended the prestigious Princeton Day School in New Jersey, where much to their father's disappointment, they were academically average and mediocre students. Their teachers at the school felt the brothers were immature for their age, but when they expressed these concerns to Jose, he refused to listen. Here's another thing. Money cannot buy intelligence or hard work. No, it cannot. And much like the Varsity Blues scandal people thinking that they can, you know, buy their kids way in, which Jose did later. You just, it, there's no substitute for just working hard. No. And yeah. trying. In an attempt to make their kids appear smarter than they were, Jose and Kitty would do their homework for them, ensuring every assignment they turned in was perfect. However, when it came time to take tests, it once again became clear that the brothers were anything but A-plus students. And the teachers all knew, by the way. I mean, obviously. Oh, yeah. They're showing up to school in limos. They're brats beyond. They're just spoiled brats. Like, no one, they didn't have to work for anything. Everything was just given to them. Well, the teacher said we would read their essays and they would be obviously written by an adult. And then we would talk to the kids and they were just kind of normal yeah they didn't Clearly, really they didn't write that yeah they didn't know it was in the essay right jose wanted the public image of his family to be picture perfect he demanded excellence from his sons and ruled his household with an iron fist eric lyle and kitty were told with whom they were allowed to associate what they were allowed to read and even what they could eat he was looking for that perfect dream yes Jose also didn't hide the fact that he thought he and his family were above everyone else in the community. Princeton Heights is an extremely affluent suburb, rich with old money. While luxury cars and million-dollar homes are the norm, residents pride themselves on class and avoid being too ostentatious. Jose did not play by these rules and would flaunt his money and power whenever given the chance. He even had his sons driven to and from school in a limo. I'm not a wealthy person. I come from very humble means and, you know, worked. Uh, law school has cost a lot. And, uh, you know, I worked. Sure. But I have had the occasion to fraternize with incredibly wealthy people. Sure. Oh, it's fascinating. Because? Oh, this whole old money versus new money. Mm-hmm. I'm trash, no money. So I don't know <laughs> what a thing is. And I was sitting with this very elegant, wealthy woman and... Who I know, her family was not wealthy. She she she's new money. She's new money, but she has the she has like the social wherewithal to know to behave like old money. Okay. She's very classy and understated. And we would see people. I was happened to be at the Ritz Carlton in the Cayman Islands, and you, this is a very rich thing to do. Oh man, in a cabana <laughs> at the Ritz? Are you kidding me? And of course, I'm just like, be cool, be cool, be cool. Don't. Don't chug a beer and crush the can on your head. You, just you know like, what? They probably would have. Pre- they just they're itching for someone to do that because oh, yeah. they all want to be have a little bit of that in them. The, everybody wants to be a redneck. Nobody wants to be a redneck. You know, at the end of the day. Yeah. But I, she, she, somebody did something. I can't remember if they had a bag. It was like a big, ostentatious designer bag, and she went. <laughs> nouveau riche which is very (laughs) and i thought you're judging other rich people for being rich it's crazy oh rich people judging other rich people is some of the judgiest stuff that you can do it was like mind-blowing i had no idea that rich people i just thought it was a rich man's club and as long as you had money you can get in the door and it's like even if you're in the door you don't belong Mm -hmm. it's nuts but these the menendez family were definitely nouveau riche but i think had the uh, ability could have acted 
you know, pretty classy, but just he just couldn't help himself. No, he I wanted to Jose, be flashy. He wanted people to know how rich they were he's and like, how spoiled they were. He was also living vicariously or trying to live vicariously through his sons. His sons were failures in his eyes, so... But he was trying to build them up to make them, you know, super popular well, and, and the his, coolest kids in school. The family, you know, his dad was a professional athlete. His mom was a professional athlete. Right. He's not. He was reasonably okay at athletics. But, like, now he, his chance is, like, my kids are going to be yes. excellent at everything. And they're kind of trash at all the things. That they were. Eric was, like, a reasonably good tennis player. But, like, at the end of yeah. the day, he's they're not. They're also just – I mean, the thing is – they're just average kids, they're and there's just, nothing wrong with being average. Most kids are just regular kids. Yes, are just regular kids and would not be a failure or disappointment in their parents' eyes. He saw them differently. He saw yeah. them as failures and probably in turn as himself as a failure. Well, I talked to someone who does uh, like statistical research on gifted and talented programs, and that's a huge issue that is new. Back in the 1990s when they introduced these programs, they would say, okay, kid number, you know, kid A, you're gifted and talented, kid B, you're average, and the parents were like, yeah, whatever, fine. Now apparently there's a push by a lot of parents to all say that their kid is gifted, and they force their kids into these AP classes when the kid, it truly is, would be an all straight A student in on track normal sure. average classes but they shove them into AP and these kids are like well I gotta take Adderall now and I gotta and they set them up to fail and you set them up to fail yeah. by by projecting on these students like well they're, they're children and saying well no 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 little Johnny is special he yeah. needs to be in AP and it's like sometimes it's okay for Johnny to be on track it's always okay it's fine yeah absolutely and that's where you would learn to excel and grow and what you're good at and what you like and what you want to do for the rest of your life instead of it being forced upon you and then you end up blowing your parents' heads off. I mean, that's what happened here. Yeah. God, they were, they were, this is a pressure cooker. They would have, started. they were normal kids and their parents turned them into something else. Correct. I'm not saying there's never an excuse to kill someone. What I am saying is they were kind of molded into hating their parents. Oh, angry sociopath behavior. Yes, yeah. Despite his efforts to appear as the perfect family, those close to the Menendezes knew of Jose's abusive and controlling behavior and saw the effects it was having on his family. One family member claimed they once saw Jose simply whisper into five-year-old Lyle's ear and reduce the boys to tears, for which he was chastised as neither boy was permitted to cry or show any sign of fear or sadness. That's so sad. Yeah, A five-year-old boy... You're just learning all about your emotions at that age, and you're having to shove them Stop down. Stop feeling things. Yeah, that's that's terrible. I'm pretty sure that family member was one of the sisters. I think it was one of Jose's sisters, and they all said, we would say, hey, maybe don't do that. And he'd be like, it's my kids. If you don't mm -hmm. like get the hell out of my house. And they're like, we couldn't. It was like we would get cut off from the kids if yeah. we told him they, yeah. they couldn't do he that. He wasn't going to have anyone tell him no Yeah, in in family, business, whatever. It appeared Kitty was also completely overwhelmed by her home life. The lavish lifestyle and lack of appropriate discipline had not surprisingly turned her sons into spoiled brats, over which she felt she had no control. According to a friend of Kitty's, they were at the mall one day shopping with Lyle and Eric, then ages five and two, when the boys ran off. When the friend asked Kitty if she was worried about them, Kitty said, Nah, they can figure it out. A few minutes later, when Kitty's name was called over the loudspeaker to pick her children up at the security desk, she told her friend, Oh, good. We can now shop without them for a little bit. That is so sad. <laughs> I mean, that's my nieces are five and two. I would have three. been losing my mind if Ella, if I couldn't find her and ran off. In a mall. She saw this as just a, In the 80s. a moment of respite where she could collect her thoughts and be without them. That's how... Little she liked them. If the kids were like 13 and 11, I would maybe be like, uh, they're at a mall. They'll probably be fine. If they were disciplined enough to yeah. know, don't leave the mall. Sure. When we were kids, our parents would ch just drop us off at the mall. Sure. Yeah. And you just like hang out or yeah. whatever. But five and two. Five and two is wild. Two, you probably can say 20, 30 words. You can't maybe. say my mama's name is Hell this. no. No, yeah. very few can. Even a five-year-old would have trouble, like, com communicating what was going on. Yeah. And then the five-year-old is responsible for the two-year-old. It's a mess. Yeah, it'll and, mess you and, up. Yeah, and that's a sad way to have a mother think about her children. I thank God they're gone for a minute. Mm -hmm. Eric and Lyle allegedly saw their mother 
beaten and berated by their father. She was treated as a maid and chauffeur for the family and was subordinated by her husband and sons. She was depressed, suicidal, and it even reportedly told Jose's sister that she wished the boys had never been born. Most people saw in Kitty's face when she looked at the kids disappointment, disgust, and just kind of like, eh, like uh, almost apathy. And they said she really wanted to be an actress. And she looked at the kids and thought, you destroyed my body. You destroyed my marriage because she would she has been quoted as saying to friends and family members, oh, kids just come between a husband and wife. Mm. And she said, you destroyed my career. And they were little assholes on so, top of that. Yeah. Well, when you don't parent them, they exactly. Turn and when you're not, I, I would imagine that they did not receive a lot of empathy or love or no. compassion from their parents growing up. And. Many studies show, I just read a study about kids that are shown empathy and sympathy from their parents from an early age, or you set them off to be much more successful in life and be able to have better relationships. They do better in work environments. So they were, this is their formative years when all of these things matter the most and they're not getting, their needs just aren't being met. Yeah, I mean, it's you're it's it is child abuse. I mean, period. it's absolutely child. It abuse. It's neglect. And we'll absolutely. Get, we'll get to the culpability in the second episode as far as like the trial and stuff. I, again, we're not forgiving them for this, but no. you can I think simultaneously two things can be true that someone was abused and then someone committed a murder for which they are fully li- like culpable. Absolutely. But it doesn't make the abuse not true, you know. Right. So, and it doesn't make the murder right. Or yeah, or forgive. But both of these things are true. Yeah. Yes. To cope with the abuse and the knowledge that Jose was having multiple affairs, Kitty began drinking heavily and taking upwards of 13 pills a day. At one point, she was rushed to the hospital for taking a large quantity of Valium. Eric claims he found a note from Kitty at the time that said, I'm sorry to leave this way. He considered it a suicide attempt, but Kitty denied this. Reportedly, one time Kitty cut herself with a kitchen knife, screamed at Lyle, and smeared the blood on his face. Lyle also wet the bed well into his teenage years, and Kitty would refuse to change the sheets, forcing Lyle to instead sleep on the floor. They also said, I believe it was Lyle, had a large stuffed animal collection. Yes, he played with stuffed animals well into his his mid-teens, like 14. You know, and maybe for a girl, you know, I mean, back then, especially, there were a lot more gender lines. That would have been a little more acceptable, but... A 14-year-old boy wetting the bed and playing with stuffed animals, that's a clear sign that something isn't right. Take him to some sort of he therapist. He needs to go see a therapist. Yeah, yes. and, and I can see a kid having one or two toys that they sort of treasure into their teen years. Right. But once you're a teen, you kind of like, you start moving on to other things. He's clearly looking for something in that relationship with a stuffed animal that he's not getting from, yeah. you know, comfort. It's... Oh, he had names for them all, and they yeah. all interacted with each other. Yeah. It was his escape. It was yeah. a way for him to detach it's a from fantasy his fantasy world. Yep, mm-hmm. shitty home life and live there. I mean, it's like a kid escaping into video games or anything like mm-hmm. that. It's just a method of, of escapism. Jose was a tyrant and repeatedly subjected the family to demented emotional abuse. One day, the family's pet ferret was found dead. Jose assumed one of their dogs that was rather aggressive had killed the small animal. The next day, the boys opened the refrigerator and to their shock and horror found the dog's head inside. Can you even imagine yeah. this? That, that is beyond fucked up. The aunt said that the dog was like, I think it was a black lab. Yeah, it was like a big black lab. And they she said, well, it was kind of aggressive and it would growl at people and kind of lunge at people. And I guess he just had enough and he cut their dog's head off. But to put it inside the refrigerator for so the, the boys to, to see. see, that is a clear message of... If you don't play by my rules and if you act out, this could happen to you. Pretty much. L- look at the power I exert over exactly. everything. Exactly. Yes. It's a power move. I am the most powerful person in this house. Don't question me. Pretty much. Another time, Lyle brought home a bunny. Jose told Lyle that the boy had to kill the bunny. When Lyle didn't go through with it, Jose called Lyle over to the trash can and showed the child the dead rabbit's body beaten to death and thrown in the trash it's I think these behaviors, it's not a far cry to, to say he probably did like hit the kids. Oh, yes. he's clearly a violent person. I think he and there hit were times, the kids and Kitty. For yeah. Sure. And there were times that and again, in all the you guys are welcome, by the way. I've had nothing but Menendez family in my head. I listened to a million hour audio book. 
Um, wait, really? It was like a million. It was. <laughs> I think it was like twenty something hours. Okay, it was really uh, long. almost a million. We'll and then I up. watched, uh, I think, seven hours of documentary. Yeah, I've watched um, a lot. I've watched several documentaries and read a lot of articles. I've seen a lot of crime scene photos. Read a lot of articles. Dude, those crime scene photos are mm. not pretty. But no. you, uh, it's not just well. Eric and Lyle testified that this happened. It's his. Jose's sister said the this. neighbors said the neighbors said they saw it the maid that worked there saw it yes I will say the one person that refuses to ever besmirch Kitty's good name ever is her brother Brian yes he is very adamant that he's like she Kitty was never did. a treasure a gem she and, was an amazing mother yes. she was like the most loving wife which that's fair I, I mean, mean he's trying to cope yeah if anyone is going to stand up for you it's going to be like someone in your own family like that well the son of two successful athletes Jose demanded that his sons also play a sport, and he would accept nothing less than excellence. Both Lyle, now 12, and Eric, 9, took up tennis, and it quickly became apparent they both had a natural gift, especially Eric, who eventually became ranked 44th in the nation for 18 and under players. It's pretty respectable. Yeah, it's pretty good. The boys were forced to practice tennis every day at 6 a.m., rain or shine, whether they were well or sick. They were not permitted to take a day off, and when they did poorly, their father would scream at them. The tennis coach said it was really weird because I would know that I still had to show up to work, even, even if it was, was down a rain. thunderstorm. And Jose would be like, get out there. Yeah. And you're With a coach. With your metal racket. And you're the coach just thinking, God, I have to stand out here too. And you know he stood out there the entire practice. And that coach is like, why am I even here? He's coaching them. He, I mean, he mar- mocked the kids. And it makes me think on Seinfeld when uh, that guy's really bad at tennis and he gets Jerry to play with him. And he's like, Milos, that's that's his name is Milos. And he's like, oh, Jerry, you're such a baby. You're so bad at tennis. So his wife will have respect for him. That's right. That's what it was. But yeah, you just think about somebody you're trying to hit and trying to do your best and someone's just berating you from the sidelines. As two young boys, I have two, I have two young brothers. I can't speak for them, but I imagine... They wanted to impress my dad by playing sports and, and do things like that. As a young boy, impressing your father and and making him proud is one of the most important things to you. And then when you not only fall short of that, but it's like thrown in your face in the most abusive and aggressive way constantly that you're a failure, that's heartbreaking. Well, and it's also, I mean, look, Eric is ranked 44 in the whole country and he's still getting screamed yeah, at. Yeah, and that's still not good so enough. So it's like you can't... Why? He could have been ranked number one and he was still got screamed oh, at. Oh, I'm sure. At tennis matches, Kitty and Jose would get into arguments and fights with officials and the boys would throw tantrums on the court. Once when Lyle was limping during a match, the result of being forced to compete despite a broken ankle, Jose stood on the sidelines and berated him for being weak. Having had enough, Lyle shouted, Just shut up! Jose... Enraged, grabbed Lyle by the neck and drug him to a waiting limousine. Once inside, Jose punched him directly in the face and told the teenager, If you ever embarrass me like that again, I will kill you. I mean, that is... It's... it's You're question, living in constant fear. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're super abused. The question is, at what point... Uh, and they t- try to tell family members and f- the family members would say, hey, you know, the boys are saying this is happening. And Kitty would say, oh, don't worry about it. It's our family. It's our business. I mean, you just hope when you turn 18 that you, you just get the fuck out. run. Yeah. Go work at fucking Bennigan's or something. You know what I mean? Like you got to kiss your out. rich laugh goodbye, but at least you're free. Yeah. But I think for Lyle, he didn't want to leave Eric. Yeah. Which that's. I he mean, worried that's, about him. Yeah. The brother's home life was extremely stressful and abusive and began to take a toll on the boys physically and emotionally. They began to grind their teeth, stutter, experience intense stomach pains, and develop alarming tempers. Well, my God. I mean, they would, see it all the time. How yeah. it's Fly off the handle. Mm-hmm. Signs also began to show that the brothers possessed some violent and perverse tendencies. In 1982, when Lyle was 15 and Eric 12, Their cousin Diane came to stay with them for the summer. One night, as the three of them were playing around and wrestling, things took a sudden turn. Without a word, Lyle and Eric began to remove Diane's clothes and tie her up, only stopping once she began screaming. God, that's horrifying. Yeah. And that is... A learned behavior. Oh, yeah. I mean, if yeah, yeah. And back then, there's no internet. They're not looking up weird, perverse videos. They... It's, 
I don't want to say it's always a learned behavior, but because of the home life they're experiencing, you can't be that surprised that they're going to turn violent, turn violent and abusive themselves. On another disturbing occasion, Diane and Lyle were alone watching TV when suddenly Lyle climbed on top of his cousin and began fondling her breast. Diane quickly shoved him off and he thankfully did not persist. Yeah, they clearly have weird, violent sexual tendencies and behaviors. Yes. And they don't. It doesn't matter if they're related to them or or not. No. No, it's, no, no. It's, yeah. there's, it's clear, there's a blurring of familial yes, lines. Yeah, yeah. And part of the, and as everybody I think knows, is part of the trial is what they deemed in the media the abuse excuse yes. that this violence, in addition to a lot of alleged sexual violence that happened to the boys, was sort of the, the reasoning for it. Because that's all trial testimony and that didn't come out until the trial, we're going to address that in part two yeah. and yeah. how it dovetails in with their defense. Yes. So, if it would be a three part series, I think if we tried to cover all, you know, cover right. that all separately. Yes. So we will definitely talk about that in the next one. Yeah. In 1986, Jose was offered an executive position with Corelco Pictures and moved the family across the country to Calabasas, California. The division Jose was heading, Home Video Entertainment, had been an outgrowth of a mafia owned adult film company that later produced films like Rambo and The Terminator after becoming legitimate and being acquired by Corelco. The sordid past of Rambo. <laughs> we never knew. Yeah, and The Terminator. I mean, it makes sense, though. But the good the good way of, you know, you come from adult film, then you can also produce the porn parodies like Ram Ho. Oh, uh, <laughs> or the Cominator. Terminator. I hardly know That's her. better. That's better than Cominator. <laughs> oh, Cominator's pretty good. That's pretty disgusting. <laughs> I am a gross human. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Combinator 1, Combinator 2, Combinator yeah. 3. Yeah, there's a whole series. Mm-hmm. Man, I had a huge crush on Edward Furlong from oh. the first Terminator. Was Rest it first piece, or second? Right? Is he dead now? I think we lost Edward Furlong. Oh, damn. Yeah, it's sad. Did I know that? Maybe. He was in the Terminator. He was the kid. Yeah, he was the kid. He was, when that came out, I was about the same age as him. Nope, he's alive. <laughs> Yo, thank God. <laughs> Who died that I'm We are very of? sorry, Edward Furlong. Corey Feldman is dead, right? No, Corey, One of, Corey Haynes dead. Corey Haynes is dead. Corey oh, Feldman Furlong is Furlong went alive. to jail a bunch of times. That's what it is. Okay. I mean, bless his heart. He suffered from Well, it. child actors, man. They've got it rough. Oh, never mind. Not bless his heart. Fuck him. He hit his girlfriend. So. <laughs> okay. Well, back before any of that happened, 12-year-old Christy had a huge crush on him because he was very cute in, in The Terminator. Oh, yeah. Childhood crushes. I mean, you that's one of those where it's like, oh, it's sacred. And I just saw a picture of him when you pulled it up, and he did not age well. Nope. Yikes. Ooh, yikes. Yeah. All right. Y'all just go ahead and Google that. It's just not the one on his Wikipedia page. It's pretty <laughs> rough. <laughs> well, as Lyle was now 17 and about to graduate from high school, he elected to stay in New Jersey with plans to attend Princeton in the fall. Which was his dad's dream to have an Ivy League school. Yep. Yeah. And he didn't get in, so by God, his kid was going to. One way or the other. However, Lyle's application to the prestigious university was rejected. Not one to understand the meaning of no, Jose donated $50,000 to the university, and the following year, in 1987, Lyle was accepted. Shocking. However, celebration faded quickly when, after just one semester, Lyle was accused of plagiarizing. And the decision was made to suspend him for one year. Are you kidding me? You mean someone who paid their way into Princeton wasn't good at Princeton also, school? someone that had their parents do all of their homework for them and never had to lift a finger? Well, there you go. Jose doesn't his... know how to write a paper now? Jose, it's his dream. Now he can write. Jose can go to Princeton vicariously by <laughs> exactly. writing all of his yeah. papers. Oh, you know what? That's what should have happened. Hey, but you know what? Nothing changes. for no. Rich people paying to get their kids in. Oh, no, I know. We're still. And Becky's going. She played not guilty. Really? She turned the original deal down. They, that Varsity Blue scandal, they offered kind of the same deal to uh, all of the participants yeah. and apparently Aunt Becky said uh, this is all going to blow over it's not a big deal didn't show to the court appearance turned down the deal everybody else took the deal and then she came back and said I've uh, made a huge mistake <laughs> she Joe blooped it and was like I made a big mistake and they said oh no it's too late we're going to charge you with 16 more things and so now she there's no more plea deal and she pretty much has to plead not guilty and take it to trial Rich people think they are above the law. She's like, I was on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> I was, uh, and she was on Full House, and yes. I believe Fuller House. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that doesn't mean that you don't have to answer for when you fuck up, Aunt Ugh, Becky. You know? 
Jose's pleas to the Board of Admissions fell on deaf ears, and rather than have his son be a Princeton failure, he decided what Lyle needed was some tough love and real-world experience, and made him move to Calabasas to live with the rest of the family. Man, that's pretty. That's still pretty shameful. Yeah, I think he was. He said, well, "If you're leaving, it's on my own terms. We're you're gonna, coming back, and you're going to work for the family company, or not family company, his company, and I'm going to make a man out of you." Andy Bernard does not lose contests. He quits them. He <laughs> wins them, or he quits them because they're unfair. <laughs> right. It's like, I do not get kicked out of Princeton. I quit it. I because it's leave me. on my own accord because I'm not going to wait around for a year because he go. was he'd been suspended for a year. Yeah. What are you and then they were going to reevaluate it after a year, but instead of you know, I don't know, doing some soul searching and maybe studying and learning how to write papers during that year. Mm-mm. Said, nope. I'm going to go work at Corel Co. Pictures. <laughs> if I didn't get my way, your ass is coming home. I'll be the executive producer for Combinator 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jose got him a job at his company with the hopes that Lyle would follow in his business footsteps. But Lyle had no interest in the position and was eventually fired for being lazy, insubordinate, and chronically late. Those are legitimate. They're legitimate reasons. (laughs) Yeah. But also, of course he is. He's he's been had everything handed in to him for 18 years however old he is at this point he's probably 19 or 20 Mm -hmm. i would not want to be the person that has to go into jose (laughs) mendez's office and be like we're gonna have to hey man your son what oh man Uh, yeah i think you just send an email and then lock did they have an email in 1990 1980 something Mm, no, I don't think they did. No, you had to typewrite it and hand it to him. <laughs> yes. and he's going to hit you. You go shove it under the door. It's the old, <laughs> after he leaves f- for home, you just push it under the Slip door. Slip it under the door. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Eric was attending the elite Calabasas High School, where he was excelling in tennis and writing screenplays with his good friend, Craig Signorelli. Signorelli described Eric as ostentatious, flamboyant, but well-liked, and someone that knew what he wanted, and would always find a way to get it. This guy's life is now, I was friends with Eric Menendez yeah, in high that's school. His and I'm going to get interviewed. I mean, <laughs> yeah. people interview him for like all the things. And he, yeah. I mean, he'll talk to him. I mean, he's getting paid. So true. One of the screenplays Eric and Signorelli worked on together was called Friends. That name's taken. It was not, <laughs> but not at this point. I don't think it had been taken at this no, point. No, 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 no. It was about a college kid named but- Joey Tribbiani. <laughs> 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 he loves sandwiches. He has a roommate named Chandler. It's amazing. And he decides to kill his parents in order to collect the insurance money. Interesting how on the nose this is. Mm -hmm. Later, Eric rewrote the beginning of the screenplay, and in an interview with ABC, Craig confirmed that the rewrite matched almost perfectly what eventually transpired at the Menendez house. It's very bad screenwriting. (laughs) Uh, The portions I've read of it. It's not very well done. It's just two rich kids. Well, in this case, it's just one rich kid. It's a smug, rich boy, and he puts leather gloves on, and he takes a revolver up to his parents' house, uh, to his parents' bedroom. And the, here's the thing, man. When you write a screenplay, I mean, it has to be action, and it's very emotionally laden. I mean, you can tell this isn't a once-removed man, ri- young boy man, writing this screenplay. It's clearly this emotional catharsis mm-hmm. that he's writing. He is acting it out. And he's like, He's acting out his fantasy. Hello, father. (laughs) Hello, father. Hello, mother. And also in in their childhood, Jose would quote to them and then force them to quote back management leadership nonfiction books. Oh, how fun. These like, if you want to be a winner, you got to act like a winner kind of books. And there's certain quotes in that screenplay that are really similar to those books that he had to quote. Just keep a diary. Yeah. Don't Don't write write a screenplay about it. Nobody wants to read your trash screenplay. Mm -hmm. Well, bored, rich, and looking for a challenge, Eric and Lyle began robbing the houses of their wealthy suburban neighbors. That's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. They would first conduct what they called, quote, hot prowls. Man. Going on a hot prowl. (laughs) That's Combinator 4, hot prowl. (laughs) Hot prowls were where they would check out the goods in the fancy houses in the area. Then after selecting their target, they would back a moving van up to the house and clean it this out. This isn't like egging your neighbor's house no. or toilet paper. just robbing them They're blind. just cr- committing. They're com- just rich, bored, privileged kids with nothing better to do. Go to the movies, for They're Christ's sake. for a sake. thrill. Oh, my God. That is what it is. They're looking for a thrill because they've never had to work for anything, so Mm-mm. they don't know what it's like to not have 
what they want, just immediate gratification. So they're doing anything they can to get their rocks off, to it's feel true. like they're... Feel alive. Uh, feel alive, yeah. Well, Lyle was the first to rob a house, stealing jewelry and silver from a girlfriend's parents. Eric, eager to prove he could be just as good as his older brother, broke into another one of the mansions and stole a few items. However, since they lived in such an upscale area, the few items he stole were worth well over $100,000. Whoops. Pretty sure that's a felony. Yep. Upon learning they had been caught stealing from their friend's rich parents, Eric wanted to return the items. Jose drove from house to house and spoke to each victim. He had the boys apologize, he would apologize, and then he would ask for a value of what had been taken and write them a check on the spot. So once again, Just covering it daddy's up. getting them out of trouble. There's no real repercussions for them being complete pieces of shit. Yep. So they learn nothing and nothing up. changes. Yeah. Nope. According to those close to him, Jose wasn't angry. His sons had been robbing people. He was angry. They got caught. I mean, that's fair. Idiots. <laughs> big fat idiots. You're big fat idiots. You got caught. He was mortified and ashamed and hired the defense attorney who had previously represented the Hillside Strangler to clean up their mess. Everybody's got a price. The brothers got probation and were also court ordered to attend therapy. Jose hired psychotherapist Dr. Jerome Ozeal to counsel the brothers and determine why they were committing crimes. Well, I think that would have taken 10 minutes of one session to be like, shitheads. Um, it's because of you. Jose. I'm, I was going to say, and I'm fairly sure that for the first few sessions, Jose sat in the room with them. Oh, my God. And he's so on, like you can say anything. That's exactly right. So he's in one chair. The boys are in the other chair. And he's like, talk. Say something to the therapist. And I think finally Dr. Jose said, you probably need to go. Yeah. I don't think they're going to talk with you in the room. Good Lord. Also, no. the prosecutor said rich people get therapy underprivileged kids get sent to prison. They go yeah, they go to jail. Shit. This is a very privileged wealthy thing is we're going to give you probation but you're also going to have to go to therapy and figure out why you're being a shithead. Mm -hmm. To distance themselves from these incidents and the Calabasas crowd, Jose moved the family to the ultra rich neighborhood of Beverly Hills. I know it's fancy because of the movie Troop Beverly Hills. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's one of my favorite movies it's growing so up. So good. good. I also know it's fancy from 90210. Oh yeah, yeah. The neighborhood was incredibly exclusive, with celebrities like Frankie Valley and Bruce Jenner, as he was then known, making it their home. The streets were lined with Mercedes and BMWs, gifts to teenagers who had just earned their licenses. Always a very good idea to give a 16-year-old a brand new Mercedes. Oh, yeah. It's the safest car. Jose and Kitty purchased a $5 million Mediterranean-style mansion at 722 North Elm Drive that had once been rented by Elton John. Neighbors remarked on its beauty and how Jose and Kitty were very proud to live there. Oh, yeah. Her girlfriends all said she just was over the moon. Yes. She, she's like, we've made it. We're in Beverly Hills. That's, I mean, just It was like, a very, uh, they felt very esteemed and like they were keeping up with the Joneses. They made it to Beverly Hills, that is. <laughs> Swimming pools, yeah. movie stars. I mean, come on. I mean, that's. You didn't look at that? look at it. Yeah, I got it. Okay, okay. There's <laughs> look at all t so many TV shows. The quintessential, that's it. Stereotypical rich. You've made it. You're rich. Is Beverly Hills? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I did a, a double decker bus tour and it went through Beverly Hills. It's very nice. It's just all the foliage is well groomed. Gorgeous and, homes. Oh, gorgeous houses every corner. Yeah. Twenty one year old Lyle was a well known ladies man, which is. Shocking. Yeah, he was not good looking. He had a mullet. I just, I'm sorry, I don't get it. Well, he was dating gorgeous women, even Victoria's Secret models. Kitty never liked any of his girlfriends, frequently calling them whores and gold diggers. I, I mean, yikes. Jose continued to demand physical and social perfection from his sons. When Lyle first started showing signs of premature hair loss, Jose forced him to start wearing a toupee and to not tell anyone. God. That's just You've so already let your father down. You're such a failure in your you father's life. You can't even grow hair. You're probably losing hair because you're so fucking stressed out that he's his hair's just falling out. And now you've got to wear a toupee, which did not look natural. Okay, so I will say I 
my whole life have seen the Menendez brothers in, you know, pictures and videos right. of the trial and stuff. And I just always wondered why his hair was so bad. <laughs> it's because it's a rug. And then when I was studying, I mean, this was a, like, light bulb moment that it was like, oh. Oh, you didn't know until now? I did not know until we were researching wow, this episode yeah, that it was yeah. a toupee. I just was like, man, he just does not know how to cut his hair. No, it was just, he he got the short end of the stick on the looks. Wow. One day, Kitty got so angry at Lyle. She reached down and ripped off the $1,500 toupee, which was glued to the top of his head. Eric witnessed this from down the hall and realized he had no idea that Lyle even wore a toupee. Crying later in their guest house, the brothers vowed never to keep secrets from one another again. Over a year later at their trial, both Eric and Lyle would take the stand and claim that it was on this night they revealed to each other that for years they had both been molested by their father. They they both realized that their parents had driven a wedge between them on purpose. Yes, their whole lives and lied to one and lied to the. I mean, pitting like, each other against the other one, yep. egging each other on to get into fights. Yes, they said when the boys cheering for them to fight each other. It was like little boy fight club when yeah. they would get into a brawl instead of saying, "All right, break it up, everybody, go to your own corners." They were like, "Yeah, hit him in the face, get yeah. him harder." It's. Very, You're gonna let your little brother hit you like that, and they—I mean—they would go at each other. They had a very emotionally, physically, and arguably sexually abusive childhood. There's no doubt about it. Well, Beverly Hills is one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. The streets are quiet, with even the business district closing up around 7 p.m. It is a safe and privileged area, and averages two murders per year. On the evening of August 20th, 1989. Those numbers were met in a grisly fashion. Jose and Kitty Menendez were watching the movie The Ten Commandments on the TV in the den of their Beverly Hills mansion when their sons, Eric and Lyle, entered the room, both armed with Mossberg 12-gauge shotguns. Jose was sitting on the couch and was shot in the back of the head. Kitty had fallen asleep next to him, and when she heard the shots ring out, attempted to run down the hall before she was shot in the leg. As she slipped in her own blood and fell to the floor, she was shot several more times in the arm, chest, and face. In an attempt to make their parents' murders look like a mob hit, Eric and Lyle also shot them both in their kneecaps. This is a grisly crime scene. Yeah. He was shot in the back of the head. So such that his head was almost destroyed. destroyed. Yeah. yeah. There was brain matter. Skull fragments. Everything on the ceiling, the windows, the floor, the curtains. It was point blank range. When the police showed up, they said it was, I mean, you're never prepared for something like that. It was but grisly. Yeah. He's, they, it's something that you never forget. Well, in the Beverly Hills PD, oh, they definitely don't see not this. Per, yes. Yeah. Two murders per year. I mean, think about how many murders we have in Dallas. That's two murders per day, maybe. Oh, yeah. More than that. And... They, in one night, have met this quota that they have. Yeah, this was shocking, especially in this neighborhood. Yeah. The brothers had previously decided that their alibi for the evening would be that they had gone to see the movie Batman and to the annual Taste of L.A. festival. After slaughtering their parents, the brothers got in their car, drove up Mulholland Drive, dumped the shotguns, then went to a local movie theater to purchase tickets for their alibi. And then they were uh, dumb because the time was stamped on the movie tickets yeah well they're dumb for a lot of reasons they also were trying to meet their tennis coach at the cheesecake factory to try to have established kind of a timeline that they were oh they were here with me but then they couldn't make it happen with his schedule and their schedule and he said i'll just come by your house and they're like no (laughs) no 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 no, not a good time not a good time please don't do that with their alibi now handled the brothers returned back to their home where just hours earlier they had brutally murdered their unsuspecting parents They parked the car around the other side of the house and walked inside. Despite neighbors later confessing they had heard multiple gunshots come from the house, no one had called 911, and their parents' bodies remained undiscovered. Yeah, the neighbor. Did you see that interview with the neighbor? And she said, my son said, Mom, that's gunshots. And she said, no, honey, it's fireworks. Go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. He, in an interview with Lyle and Eric, they say after, because they shot them multiple times, and... With shotguns, which are loud. Very loud. And it's a very quiet neighborhood, and it was an unseasonably warm night. So people had their windows open to, like, let air flow in. Mm. 
And so everything echoes. And Lyle and Eric said they just sat down on the stairs just waiting to hear sirens because they they assumed any second the police would show up. And then they're like, oh, I guess they're not. So now we're going to leave. So then you leave. Hours later, you come back. It's it's like time stood still. Like nothing has happened. So I just imagine ugh, putting yourself in. You walk in you're, and you see like the reality starts to sink in what has happened. Well, and they said that Eric kept just saying the gun smoke, the gun smoke. I could just smell this gun smoke, which kind of tipped the cops off that they were the killers. But that's they sat there in the gun smoke. They shot their parents with these shotguns, which produce a ton of right. smoke. And they sat on the stairs, wait, like you said, waiting for the siren, and nothing came. And so they picked up all the shotgun shells, went around driving on Mulholland Drive. And he said, Eric said in his The Menendez Murders, uh, Eric Speaks, he says, we just didn't know where we were going. It's a documentary on Netflix. It's wild. Yeah. With a plan in place to profess their innocence, Lyle called the police at 11.47 p.m. Crying and screaming. Somebody killed my parents. Police were immediately dispatched, and within minutes, the mansion was swarming with local authorities. The the 911 call is pretty emotionally... It is. I, maybe because I listened to it knowing the what truth. really happened. I hear... It's fake. I hear the fakeness in it. It doesn't sound genuine. He sounds like he's putting on a show. I'm sure he's still upset. I mean, you just killed your parents that's upsetting but it doesn't sound authentic like somebody killed my parents i walked in and my parents have been well and they also say statistically when someone finds a body that they run to an alternate location especially Mm. later when they tell detective zoller oh man there was so much gun smoke and then detective zoller's like the natural nine nine times out of ten 99 percent of the time you walk in there's this grisly horrifying murder mm-hmm. scene the smoke is still in the air you're thinking they're still there oh shit oh shit i'm not safe yeah. let me run out and there i'm obviously go to not, my neighbors i'm not gonna save them right so i'm gonna go to the neighbors and they said detective zoller was like the first one that kind of starts looking a little yeah hot, like mm. also if you walked in that scene you wouldn't want to be in that room That's with that he, that scene. They said they wondered how they stayed in the house. Yeah, you'd get the fuck out. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, upon arriving, the Beverly Hills PD ordered Eric and Lyle out of the house. The brothers ran out, and Eric fell to his knees and began pounding the ground. The police were so convinced by the boys' anguish, they failed to test either of their hands for gunshot residue. Yeah, and again... And had they, it would have... Been, I'm sure have been up to their elbows. Been slam dunk right there. I wonder. <laughs> they too, would have been taken in. And this may be something I'll have to look up. And maybe talk about in the second one. They're do they change clothes? I guess. I'm. Sh- I would imagine they would have had to. They would have been covered in. It just blood was everywhere. In everything. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. But they. I when you shoot a gun and you wash your hands, are there still traces of gunshot I think residue? So. I think you'd really have to scrub it off. Yeah. And Although this was 1989, so I don't know if the, the testing has changed. But they absolutely would have. I mean, every authority and professional has said they had gunshot residue on their hands. And if they had been, if their clothes had been tested and if their hands had been tested right there, they would have been taken immediately. But the Beverly Hills PD kind of, the patrol people at least that showed up initially thought, oh my God, these poor guys. Also, it's Beverly Hills. These are two very rich boys. Yeah. If this had been in a different area... They've probably been they arrested. Would, they would not have been let go. Absolutely. Not with the LAPD in the 1980s. Money and privilege does a lot for you with the legal system. Well, Mo Angel, a patrolman on the scene, was more skeptical as he noticed when the officers were not looking, the boys stopped crying and would instead whisper to one another. It was also bizarre that having the, left the crime scene shortly after police arrived, Eric and Lyle returned around 3 a.m., and asked to go in the house to get their tennis equipment. Yeah, they were... That's a kind of a red flag. Yeah, the detective was a little shocked. And also, there's they're still processing the crime scene dummies. Like, Yeah, why do you need your tennis... I mean, we find why out. they need it. <laughs> detective Zoller found this surprising and told the boys to come back at 8 a.m. Not once to follow the rules, they instead went in, grabbed a tennis bag, and left. What detectives didn't know... Was it inside the bag were the spent shotgun shells that the boys had picked up after shooting their parents and the receipts for the guns they had purchased. Yeah. So why aren't there fucking cops following their asses around? It's the same thing with the Ramseys. When you're rich, you just get treated 
you're allowed to very, do it. Very, very different. Oh, yeah. You're allowed to do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my God, OJ's going on at the same time. And look what's going on in that trial yeah. while this is happening. Immediately upon their parents' death, Eric and Lyle were entitled to $250,000 each from life insurance policy. However, the entire Menendez estate had an estimated value of 8 to $14 million to be distributed via Jose and Kitty's wills. However, there was an issue with finding the parents' will. So things like insurance policies are what's called a non-probate asset that passes with a beneficiary designation. So that's why they immediately got this payout. Mm -hmm. But then probate assets would be like the house and the cars and the cash in the bank. And that passes through the will. So that's probate assets. So they would have to wait for the will to come out. Uh, for the will to be probated to get their money. To see what they were entitled yeah. to? Yeah. The first will was found, typed and left in a bathroom drawer, was dated 1980, and left all of the family money to the boys. However, there was an IBM XT model computer in the Menendez family home, which supposedly contained the parents' new will. When Lyle heard that the family planned to search the computer, he flew home from the memorial service on the East Coast, back to L.A., and hired a computer expert. Which I bet there was like one of them back then. <laughs> <laughs> just You just looked in the phone book for a computer expert, and it was one dude. Yeah. He asked the expert to erase documents called Eric, Lyle, and Will, and asked the expert to make sure that no one could recover those files. The expert erased the whole hard drive. Then Lyle asked him to reinstall those files, but now completely blank. They asked the computer expert guy, and he said, oh, I thought that was three names. Oh, yeah. I thought it was three files, and it, one was about a guy named Eric, one was about a guy named Lyle, and one was about a guy named Will. He that said, I never sense. thought it was like a will and testament. He my probably question, didn't even know who these kids were. No, my question is, who, who's typing their own wills? Don't do that. If you're worth- four, Jose, who thinks he's above I guess <laughs> everybody true. else, if he you're can do a better job than anybody? More than like- a hundred dollars. Just get a lawyer. <laughs> Just get a lawyer to do your will. Don't do legal zoom. Don't do uh, type it on your IBM computer and have your, you know, kids erase it. Go just get a lawyer. Yeah, just get a lawyer, especially when you probably have several on retainer. Yeah. I'm sure they had many lawyers. They hired the Hillside Strangler guy. Yeah. I think they could probably yeah. afford to get a estate planning attorney. About a week before the murder, family friend Karen Farrell was visiting the family's home. She chatted with Kitty as Kitty was typing on her computer. Karen asked what Kitty was doing, and Kitty announced she was cutting the boys out of the will. Karen pointed out that Lyle was down the hall and probably heard what she said. Kitty said, I don't care. They know we're cutting them out of the will. Why are you typing your will while your friend's at your house? <laughs> Just stop typing your own will. It seems like a passive-aggressive, maybe not even passive, power move to the boys. To be like, look what we can do yeah. at any time. We have this literally at the tip of our fingertips, and we can this, this change it, all, change it, whatever floppy we want. Drive. Yes, floppy disk. In May of 1989, Jose also had a conversation with friend Carlos Baralt and his wife, in which he complained at how disappointed he was in his children and how he planned on cutting both boys out of his will. So this was sort of a well-known among their friend circles that Jose and Kitty were kind of over the kids. Yeah, they were done with them and the family. Yeah. I think everyone saw that relationship was very strained. Yeah. Since Home Video, the company where Jose worked, was originally owned by mafia-related parties, Eric and Lyle immediately tried to blame the mafia for the crime. Detectives were not convinced, based on the crime scene. Mafia-style killings are normally done with a single shot, normally with a silencer, and rarely do they target family members or leave such gratuitous crime scenes. Hitmen also often strike their targets at times of convenience and don't usually risk breaking into homes and being caught. Yeah, they said a couple of the detectives just weren't convinced it was the mafia because of the grizzly. It was so grizzly. The huge mess that they left. And also just because they, they said no hitman is going to shoot off a Mossberg 12 gauge <laughs> multiple at times. 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. on a. A warm night in Beverly Hills they when said, possibly the boys could be there. They, well, they said he's the guy. If it was a mafia hit, they would have like waited for him in his car at the office. Yeah, exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? They wouldn't risk having somebody call the cops. Although it sounds like in Beverly Hills back then, you could just sort of <laughs> shoot whoever you wanted. <laughs> no, because it was so crazy to think those were gunshots because yeah. it was so unheard of. Yeah. Initially, the brothers weren't considered suspects, but in the weeks following their parents' murders, that began to change. Lyle had his father's American Express Platinum card with a $250,000 limit for which both Eric and Lyle were approved to use. 
Within four days after having shot their parents, the boys spent $16,938 at the mall, including an $11,000 Rolex that Lyle wore to his parents' memorial service. They said he also wore his dad's shoes, and he made a big showing of tapping the aunt on the shoulder and said, hey, look, people said I couldn't fill my dad's shoes. Oh, look God. Now. I heard that in multiple interviews, and it was just like, yuck. Yeah, that God. is very yuck. And later at the trial, when they bring that up about the spending, they try and say, well, we were with our uncle at the wherever you buy a Rolex. The Rolex store. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Rolex store. And they he was getting one, and they said, hey, why don't you get something nice to wear to your parents' memorial service? They also said that their uncle had to approve anything they bought. And so regardless if that's the case, though, if you – are innocent are you going on a shopping spree a few days after your parents were brutally killed in your home or even if you were guilty and you had two brain cells to yeah run together, that's insane would you go around but no i think that maybe the and again we talk about this with the ramseys too of you know what's appropriate behavior yeah. and i mean who's to say if your parents are you know allegedly killed by the mafia how you react but i think in this case these were below average students and just not a not real thinkers their and whole also life. they've had everything handed to them they haven't had real world circumstances or what's the word i'm looking for like they had no requirements they've they've never gotten in trouble for anything except for not playing tennis good. They, <laughs> like everything they do they get somebody takes care of it for them, so they don't even understand why this might be considered a faux pas. They also were staying for the immediate time right after the murders. They were staying in a fifteen hundred dollar a night hotel room that Corelco Pictures was paying for, that Home wow. Video was paying for, because Home Video was sort of trying to say we we are really sad about this executive's passing, and we just want to assure the public it was not the mafia. Please believe right, us; right. it was not the mafia, and no one at this time knew it was the kids. Yeah. Eric and Lyle also briefly hired a body- bodyguards for a time, and then it was a little as bit as a like, front, yeah. just to show like, oh, we're scared they might. And come the after family's us. like, oh god, well they're scared, they're so scared they got bodyguards, and it get to be they got a little annoying, and so they said, if eh, you're so scared, fine. don't have a paper trail of all these flashy things you're buying. You're gonna get robbed. Well, their shopping spree continued, with Lyle buying a sixty-four thousand dollar Porsche. And a buffalo wing restaurant in Princeton, New Jersey. I mean, to be fair, I would buy a buffalo wing <laughs> restaurant. It sounds awesome. Yeah. You come into a buttload of money all of a sudden. And like, you buy uh, buffalo wild wings. Hell yeah. Where do you get your wings from? Oh, <laughs> I am a wing stop girl. Okay. I love a wing stop. I will. Th- there used to be a good wing place and it got bought out. That was over behind the Sam's Club. Uh-huh. But it got bought out and it's somebody else out. So it's no good. I am a 100% wing stop girl. Garlic parmesan all the way. God, no. Oh, man. I just like regular. Garlic parm all the way and ranch. And I love oops all carrots. So I get a side of vegetables, carrots only. Don't come in with celery. I'll throw in the trash where it belongs. (laughs) Oh, say I like the celery better than the carrots. The the Wingstop Ranch is the best ranch. It's so good. I don't know what they do to it. It's so good. I'm trying to remember the name of this wing place in Mesquite that I discovered when I was doing Atkins years ago, and it is, I'm going to say it, it's better than Wingstop. Where's it at? God, I cannot, by the second episode, I will have the answer to what the name of this Wingstop place is. It's a, an individually owned mom, oh, okay. and, mom and pop place. It's so freaking good. But does Troy Aitman do their ads? No, he doesn't. Does Super Bowl champion Troy Aitman <laughs> do their ads? Also, I like all flats. Oh, do you? I mm-hmm. like a mix. I'll do a mix. I... I like all flats, but as a lot of places won't give farm. it to you. See, I like regular. All and flats, I, they'll just charge you extra at Wingstop. Yes, but some places at Wingstop, they're, they're like, oh, we don't have enough to do that because if other people want. I don't oh, know. Man. I got into it once about that. It them. sounds like you're they a also menace. Very, I am. I, I think <laughs> what we're discovering is I cause problems any fast food place I go to. Also, Wingstop fries. Whew. Oh, God. So good. God damn it. Good I want seasoning. Wingstop so bad right now. Yeah, the, the seasoning's great. I'm sorry for anyone, uh, any of our listeners outside of the Dallas Fort Worth area. Is that a only DFW I think it's, thing? It's pretty national, but if you're in Canada or Australia or wherever, I'm so sorry. Come to Dallas. We'll show you a good time at Wingstop. Oh, yes, we will. Well, the brothers also bought side by side condos in Marina del Rey, went on several overseas trips to London and the Caribbean, 
and took joy rides around Beverly Hills in their deceased mother's Mercedes-Benz SL convertible. Eric also hired a full-time tennis coach, costing 50 grand per year, bought a $17,000 Jeep Wrangler, and invested 40 grand in a rock concert at LA's Palladium. They clearly just should not be trusted with money <laughs> or being adults or anything. I want to know what this rock concert was. I don't know. Did you know that there is Todd Anderton, a uh, very funny Love Todd. comedian and actor, he showed me that there's apparently a special edition basketball card that in the background of this basketball player's photo, the Menendez brothers are courtside. Oh, I did not know that. Yes, so you can find it on like eBay and you buy the special basketball card that has the player. It's obviously in focus as the player, but then in the background is the Menendez Wow, players. I Crazy. bet that goes for a cool, cool something. It's like 20 bucks. Oh, never mind. I think there's Thought a lot of been them more. and it's not a good player. But that's just the type of people they were like courtside. They were buying rock concert. I mean, who even was does it, this? Was it after they'd killed their parents? I think it was before. Oh, okay, but still... Yeah. It'd probably be worth more if it was after. Yeah. Well, overall, they spent approximately $1 million in the first month after the murders. Unbelievable. Really. Eric was still seeing his therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. Racked with guilt and unable to talk to anyone else about what he and his brother had done, three months later, he confessed during one of their sessions that he and his brother had murdered their parents. Apparently, Eric was just saying, I'm suicidal. I can't take this. I, I can't take this anymore. And Dr. Oziel said, what do you have to be? I mean, I know your parent. you lost your parents, but what's so bad? And was a therapist. And then it came out. Yeah. And it came out. And he, bl- he sort of just blurted out and said, me and Lyle did it. And he was like, oh, oh. No. <laughs> He told the doctor they had planned the murders for weeks. And Eric now felt so guilty, he contemplated taking his own life. Dr. Ozeal instructed Eric to call Lyle and bring him to the office so the three could discuss this together. Because Lyle's a reasonable person. He just shot his parents to death. (laughs) Just bring him into your office and chat with him. Let's have all, let's let's just get together. It goes as well as you can imagine. Meanwhile, Dr. Ozeal's other patient and current lover, Judalon Smith, was sitting in the waiting room. Dr. Okay, so Ozeal, we're getting a little picture of what this guy, how this doctor operates. Dr. Ozeal is a fucking train wreck. Yeah. <laughs> we'll he's, learn he's way. He's married, sleeping with one of his patients, and he's got the Menendez is now in his office that he's trying to, to get murder. to confess to something. And we'll get more into Dr. Ozeal in the trial, but it is just... I had no idea. Yet again, as a kid, you know, I sort of knew them in the background, knew them from SNL and like Dana Carvey making fun Mm -hmm. of them. But you just don't realize that this Ozeal guy's life is totally entwined and comes out at the trial. And this trial was just a huge mess. Yeah. And this is just step one of having his lover in the waiting room. He was ethically and morally not the best. Not the best. He's a little corrupt. Lyle arrived and was incredibly angry with Eric for spilling their secret. Lyle told Eric, with Dr. Ozeal in the room, We've got to kill him now, too. Doctor-patient confidentiality protects a doctor from telling about a past crime the patient has committed. However, if the doctor believes a patient is imminently going to commit a future crime, he has an obligation to inform the potential victim of imminent threat. Here, the potential victim was Dr. Ozeal himself. Yeah, this is a... This is a conundrum. Conundrum. <laughs> this is, they don't teach you this in medical school, in no. psychology school. But they, I will say that is one of the questions you get when someone says, no, it's doctor-patient confidentiality. Really? I can tell you anything? And it's mm, like... To a degree. All, I mean, it's you can tell them almost anything, and it really could be... If you say, I'm going to go home and murder my wife after this session... They can that, call the cops. They are going to call the cops but and tell them But if you say, that. man, I've just really been thinking that... I'm going to murder my wife. I've just really been thinking about it. They can't tell anybody. Right. They can't tell anybody. They Which have to is be like, so weird. I mean, it's the same thing with how we've talked about stalking laws. Well, you can't really do anything until they've done something. Yeah. And then it's too late. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, that the question is, is public weighing this public policy question of shouldn't that be such a sacred bond that you are allowed to tell the doctor anything Mm -hmm. versus it endangers someone's safety. And when it is a a credible imminent threat, that's Mm -hmm. whenever you're, but there's been cases uh, that you learn about in law school. Kim Kardashian's not going to learn this, but I'll, (laughs) I'll tell you, Uh, you You should listen to Sinister Hood. Can you just for a while move to California to maybe be her mentor? (sighs) 
if Kim Kardashian needs a Texas bar mentor, just kidding. <laughs> I you would have love to, it. You have to go to law school here. Uh, <laughs> but there's the cases that you read about where psychologists ha- are told by their patients, man, I don't know. I'm really thinking about killing my wife. Uh, sh- I don't know. And then they kill the wife. And or, and then they call the wife, the, the therapist calls the wife and says, hey, get out of your house. You know, mm-hmm. this is dangerous. And they get sued by the patient and mm-hmm. the patient wins. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, but but do you say, OK, well, fuck it. I got sued, but I would never have forgiven myself if he would have done. Yeah. It. I mean, it's it's not a very black and white situation. But in However, this case, I think, yeah, but I do think it's patient doctor confidentiality is super important because a lot of people just have those thoughts. And if they don't have someone they can tell those thoughts to that isn't going to judge them and is going to help them and they can be a sounding board oh, to work through it. So important. Then maybe they don't actually go through with it. And, you know, they're just looking for a release. So if you feel like you don't have that trust in someone and you keep it bottled up, that's when things go south. And who's to say that if the brothers had actual therapy their right. whole life, they might not have come out Absolutely. this way. Absolutely. But you're sit, you're the doctor. Your patients just said, "I didn't like poison my parents, or I didn't like hit them with the car. I shot them repeatedly yeah. in the face with a shotgun." With my brother, by the way, who's now here, we've got to kill him too. And if it had stopped before, we've got to kill him too. Legally and ethically, the doctor could not have said anything. And he probably, yeah. Because it had already he, happened, he wouldn't right? He not have any fear. Yeah, no, he wouldn't have called the cops or anything. Yeah. No. But because they threatened him, now it becomes an imminent threat. The brothers left his office, and Dr. Ozeal stood with Smith in his office. Who he told, which not ethically allowed to tell. Yeah, no. The person that, when there's an imminent threat, you're allowed to tell the authorities. Like a famous case. Not I- the patient you're boning yeah so i think it's the famous california case and he calls it's a university student that was at risk and he calls like the campus police and he mm-hmm. calls the university so you can't just go and open your window and go oh my patient said this yeah excuse me lover come in here there's a Let chain me. of command yeah that you have to follow he wasn't he was a little off on what he was doing he also called his wife and children and told them they were in danger and to leave town for a few days he said he would be staying with his friends jim and judy a lie so that he could stay with smith Downstairs, the brothers were standing outside of Eric's new Jeep. Lyle told Eric, He's going to tell. We have to kill him. I can't kill anyone else, Eric said. Plus, Eric reasoned, if their therapist showed up dead just months after their parents, the police would likely suspect them. Lyle left in a fit of anger. Oh, I by the way, point, <laughs> Judalon Smith said that Ozeal saw him out the window, saw him down there talking. And they're just yelling at each yeah. other. And he's thinking, I bet they're plotting to kill me down yeah. there. They were. They yeah. were. So get on the phone. Call your, your wife that you should be going home to. Yeah. Meanwhile, Dr. Ozeal called his mentor and fellow psychologist, Dr. Jeff Lulo who knew Dr. Ozeal was treating the Menendez brothers, to ask what he should do. Yeah, apparently Ozeal didn't say, My, the Menendez brothers said they're going to kill me. He said, I have some patients who, killed, brothers. who killed their parents very brutally, and now they said they're going to kill It was like Dr. Lulo said, I very quickly knew what he was yeah. implying. Dr. Lulo suggested that Dr. Ozeal take his session tapes and notes, make three copies, and put them into three different safe deposit boxes. He should then give his lawyer the location and combination to the lock boxes and instruct the lawyer to open the boxes in case anything should happen to him. Finally, Dr. Lulo suggested that Ozeal tell the Menendez brothers about his fail-safe plan. Being a psychologist is a very dangerous job. It is. I mean, you're dealing with these it people really who are not only capable of murder, but have already done it. Yes, you're dealing with... Potentially a lot of mentally unstable people that are violent. going through very hard times in life. They can be violent. They can act out. It is a very dangerous job. Man, it's a passion. That's a that's a calling. Yes, I have a lot of the utmost respect for therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists. A few days later, both brothers returned to Doctor Ozil's office, where Doctor Ozil told them about the plan. Lyle asked Doctor Ozil if he was afraid. Ozil replied, "I don't like to live in fear." My father felt the same, Lyle replied. Dr. Ozeal relented. Okay, I get it. I get it. He then offered to the brothers that their therapy notes may actually aid in their defense, partially to be helpful and partially in hopes the two men wouldn't kill him as well. 
Ozil had also wanted to record the sessions to later play for Smith in a supposed attempt to impress her. God. Come on. That's so gross. There, we, we'll get into the Judalon Smith, Dr. Ozil love affair because it actually is very important to the trial, I think. And there's just a lot of two... They're just so bizarre to believe that they're true. But then there's evidence of them, of mm-hmm. things that are happening. Mm-hmm. And one of those is recording sessions from celebrity murderers. And I mean, they became celebrities after this to impress your yeah. lady friend. Wow. He also told her that if anything were to happen to him, to check the tapes for answers. It is unclear whether or not she was impressed. But upon listening to the tapes, Smith went to the police. And in March 1990, both Eric and Lyle were arrested for the murder of their parents. I don't mean to laugh, (laughs) but really, you doctor, you let your lover listen to it and she snitched? Yeah. I mean, good for her. Again, it's it's one of those things where it's on your conscience and the cops are out spinning their wheels trying to figure out if it's the mafia, figure out if it's some sort of... Because uh, Jose Menendez was planning on running for Senate if it was some sort of like a political Mm -hmm, hit. He was planning mm -hmm. on moving to Miami and trying to run for Senate and he planned on making Cuba a state. Oh, okay. That was his long-term plan. And so they were like, is this a political assassination? And the the cops are wasting all these resources when there is recordings of them saying they did it. They just come and hand it to him. But can you believe that police the, the, be the officer that takes that meeting where it says a lady here said she's sleeping with her <laughs> therapist, who's also the Menendez brothers therapist. And she said she overheard some stuff. Wait, what? You can't make it up. You can't yeah. make this case up. So what do we think? Well, they killed their parents. I think that's there's no denying that. They okay, admit it at all. Uh, eventually. Yes. The trial. As much of, of a strange set of facts. This is the trial. trials are a shit show. Oh, man. And we will get into them on the next episode. On part two. Part two. Well, many of you have asked if we have a Patreon where you can donate to the show. We do. Our show will always remain free. But if you wish to donate to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit patreon.com forward slash sinisterhood. You can get some sweet perks like Patreon exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, and a special shout out on the show and a monthly bonus mini sode, which we just did one. Whew. That was a tough one. It was about the Bjork stalker, Ricardo Lopez. Shout and- out to my brother in law, Aaron, for suggesting yes. that topic. It is, uh, it's a doozy. It's a weird internet underground kind of well known tape that got passed around, and then the background on it is just, whew. Yeah. So if you're a patron, you can log on right now and listen to it. Also, make sure you join the Facebook Patreon page if you're in that tier. We are taking questions for a live Q&A that we will do later this month. Yeah, we can't it's wait. So have fun. you guys give us some questions and then we will answer it on camera. So we do have some Patreon shout outs. Abby Finnegan, Sarah McLean, Lindsay Buzak. Alicia Azell, Sanam, Vacation Wolf. Hell yeah. <laughs> Lydia Milan Ramos. Lauren A. Pack, Sarah and Ryan Bray. Oh Alex my. Wade, I love you. Oh, Christine Anaya. Severina. Andrea Gray. Angela DeLucia. Brandon Mullins. Melissa Coons. And Michaela Winters. Thank, Thank you, you guys. so much. And also, you should all get your stickers. I mailed them already. Yes. And this week, Austin Guttery from Austin Guttery Artworks was at my house for improv practice and drew fun, spooky things on the back of all the Patreon Ooh. envelopes. So he drew a real mean looking skull and then a happy little ghost. Oh, let us know which one you get. Tag us when you get them. Oh, we wanted to thank Vulture and New York Magazine for the write-up about our New Jersey Watcher episode. We appreciate that they also rue the day that baby doll shirts were made (laughs) and can appreciate some good Costco meatballs. So if you haven't checked out our article on Vulture, you can check it out at SinisterHood.com as well as it is on our Instagram page. Absolutely. Well, the best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. And stay tuned. We have a special iTunes review contest. Oh, yes. We'll reveal it in the Menendez Part 2, but it's going to involve me and Christy going to a real spooky place if we hit a certain number. So we'll we'll give you – in the meantime, if you go and review us, you can help bump the number up now. Yes. But – 
when we hit a threshold, Christy and I are going to do something crazy. So we are going to do something crazy, and tuned. we are going to film it. So that sounds awful. <laughs> it's something to do with ghosts, not a weird sex thing. But thank you so much. Well, I don't. I mean, maybe I don't know. You who's, never, how many reviews do we say? get? I don't know. Yeah, it depends on how many reviews we get. <laughs> Well, uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Also, there are Vulture articles on all three of those places. Christy, where are you at? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? You can get me on Instagram at Heather vs. The World or on Twitter at MCK vs. The World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Sinisterhood.